Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Fielding at Hush Blackwell, and we want to welcome you here today to our quarterly review of commercial and ag lending disputes. Uh, we're covering Q3 of 2023, the latest and greatest right, cases that have come out uh, in the past, roughly the past quarter. Uh, I have a few housekeeping items I have to cover here really quick, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So at the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple uh, application icons for your use during the program. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them via the question box. We will try to answer all of the questions during the webcast today, but if a fuller answer is needed, we'll uh, need to follow up with you via email. Um, a PDF of the presentation is available in the programs folder today. We have both the PowerPoint and then a, a PDF document, which is essentially the same material, but not in a PowerPoint format, just a little bit easier to, to read through it. Uh, the program has been approved for legal education and HR hours for live attendees. You, you will report your hours by clicking on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast for watching and sharing and putting young children to sleep as well. Uh, if need be. Uh, toward the end of the program, be sure to complete our short survey. Uh, and we really pay attention to the survey. We really appreciate the feedback that we give because it helps us custom tailor uh, content for future webinars that will be more beneficial for you. Um, so with that, we can get started here. Just a, a quick introduction. Uh, what uh, this idea started, uh, I don't know, at the beginning of this year, what we've been doing is a quarterly review of uh, distressed commercial and ag lending disputes. What I do is every single day I'm getting cases from across the country and, and the cases that really catch my eye, I just kind of throw them in a pile. And then uh, towards the end of the quarter, I go back and do a quick summary of them. Uh, and then we talk about them because frankly, the best way to learn is, is frankly, learning from the mistakes or events or, or uh, uh, the events and occurrences of other people. So that's what we're trying to do here today. Our next webinar that we're going to be doing, our next quarterly webinar will be on December 6th at noon central time. So if you want to put that on your calendars, you can do that as well. So joining me, at, uh, and I should do the introductions, uh, joining me today uh, are uh, uh, Tom Donaldson and, and Chris Miles. Uh, all three of us deal with uh, lenders. Uh, Tom is on the front end of the deals. Tom is a partner in our St. Louis uh, banking and finance group, and, and he helps uh, do the deals when everything is good, right? When, <laughs> when people are smiling and shaking hands. Chris and I were in the Kansas City office. We're on the back end when the deals all go down the toilet and everybody's fighting over who gets the money. So that's the quick intro on us. So uh, with that, we're going to just plow through. We do this in the quiz format just to make it a little bit more interesting. So, Tom, why don't you uh, take us away with quiz number one? Great. Thanks, Mike. And uh, don't worry, you're not going to be called upon. We're going to answer our own questions, but uh, we've, we've got it. If you haven't attended this before, we've got it set up as a question and answer, but uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll cover both. So let's start out with question number one. There are generally two different ways that lenders take liens or, or, or uh, finance vehicles as collateral. Uh, one of them would just be a straight up vehicle acquisition loan, which would be a purchase money security interest. Uh, and then the other would be uh, a refinancing, uh, taking out an existing lender. So uh, as you all probably know, uh, liens are perfected in uh, pretty much all states, probably all states by notation on the title the vehicle title and virtually all states now are e-lien states where those liens are, are registered or recorded electronically. So in this particular case, the bank provided refinancing for the debtor's vehicle, but incorrectly filed its lien as if it were an acquisition as opposed to a refinancing. So the bankruptcy trustee later sought to avoid the lender's lien. Who wins? Answer, the trustee. So this, this case was in uh, the state of Kansas. Uh, Kansas uh, has a, um, an e-lien statute, um, like most states. And this is really a, 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 a situation where the incorrect form was, was completed online. The, 
the lender who is providing the refinancing inadvertently filed it as an acquisition lien and ended up showing actually as a second lien behind the um, the first lien lender. And um, <clears throat> you know the the uh, court in this case strictly applied the statute said you you just you filed the wrong one we see that you're showing up on title as a second lien but that's that's not what this was uh and um and and so you know keep in mind here as far as a takeaway that um you know trustees love to try to knock out liens uh in this case just just because a mistake was made uh, and to make sure that you have strict compliance procedures in place as far as something as easy as figuring out which which form you need to file. With that, that's another right. question two. Question two. All right. So this is for anybody that's dealing with consumer home loans. Uh, and and even if you don't do that as your kind of primary occupation, occasionally you'll you'll deal with these and it's important to know about this this little caveat, all right? So the general rule in chapter 13 is that, hey, if you have a home loan, sorry, can't use chapter 13 to modify the mortgage, okay? That's kind of the general uh, the general thinking. And that's generally true, but there's one little important exception under section 1322C2, which says if the loan comes due prior to the proposed final payment under the plan, then they can do the modification, okay? so. What we have here, this is a case out of uh, Eastern District of North Carolina, came out in May of this year. You have this debtor who inherits this one-fifth interest in the home, comes from his mom who had a reverse mortgage on the property. So she dies, uh, the debtor inherits the property. He's not liable on the note, okay? But he, you know, he owns that one-fifth interest in the property. And, and because the debt encumbers the property, even though the debtor himself is not personally liable, he can structure the plan, or that's what he proposed to do here, is to structure the plan uh, to use this section 1322C2 exception to modify the lien. So obviously the lender objects, no one wants to, you know, how do you sell four fifths of a house, right? It's, it's problematic. And, uh, and so the question is who's going to win? Well. In this case, the bankruptcy court said the debtor wins. And, and, and here's the key point here. So when mom dies, because this is a reverse mortgage, that accelerates the debt. No surprise there. All right. That happens pre-petition. So that means the full amount of the due is, uh, excuse me, full amount of the debt is due uh, uh, prior to the debtor's plan, okay? And so the court says, hey, this is just smack down, right down the middle of the section 1322C2 exception, all right? So then what's the what's the takeaway? You're like, well, that rarely happens, right? How many of us have debtors that have, you know, inherit reverse mortgages? Hardly any, right? I get that. But the point here is that number one, you got to remember that there's an exception to this rule. And I think a lot of times people forget this exception. And then number two, uh, you really start needing to think about if you have a debt, because a lot of times your, your home mortgages, they're going to be 30 year, sometimes 15 year. And, you know, chapter 13 is only meant to be five years at the most. And so a lot of times these mortgages are going to extend beyond that due date. It's not a problem. But if you get into a situation where you've now, you've, you've got this debt and it's you know, straddling these two lines, but now we've accelerated it. So now suddenly the debt's over here, it's just all owed. Then you're potentially putting yourself at risk that they could go in and try to use that exception to try to modify the payment on the loan. Now, admittedly, there was the five-year limit, so they can't do this in perpetuity uh, under the plan, but it's, an, and it, it's an important when you're thinking about strategy and what do we do here, it's good to know just that this rule is out there. So, all right, let's move on because chapter 13 is not terribly interesting. All right, next one, Chris. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this, uh, we have a question. When does the statute of limitations begin to run on a promissory note? And um, before we go to the answer, uh, the facts of this particular uh, case were that uh, a loan was taken out in either the late 90s or the early aughts. We're not sure, but the maturity date on the promissory note was 2017. Uh, the borrowers stopped making payments 
in 2003. And finally, in 2021, the lender got around to uh, trying to enforce its rights. And our answer is that the statute of limitations uh, to collect on promissory notes begins to run either at the maturity date or uh, at the point when a debt has been accelerated. And in this particular case, the lender had not taken any specific actions to accelerate the loan, uh, but the maturity date uh, ran on 2017. So when the lender sought to enforce four years later, it was within uh, the statute of limitations. The borrowers argued that, no, we actually defaulted back in two, 2003, and that, uh, that should have started the statute of limitations running. Court rejected that argument. Uh, some takeaways from this case is that uh, the lender got lucky here, <laughs> um, and and it uh, in fact the the court uh, in its decision weighed both and direct quote said that the lender had the better argument. So that's sort of damning with with faint praise. Um, note on forbearance agreements, which are often used by lenders, uh, most forbearance agreements will have some kind of a recitation that the borrower is in default. Um, and there's often been an action to accelerate the debt uh, in some form or fashion prior to a forbearance agreement being entered. Uh, and so you want to make sure if you are doing forbearance agreements and you're sitting in the lender's seat that you have appropriate waivers in there, for example, waiving the statute of limitations defense, which, which is waivable. Um, you also may want to put in language uh, that expressly uh, decelerates the loan if an action's been taken, um, because otherwise, you're, uh, if there's a breach of the terms of the forbearance agreement later on down the line, a borrower may say, well, we have this recitation that a default had already happened and the statute of limitations has been running the entire time, you can't enforce, and oh, look at this other provision, and there's a common provision in most uh, most forbearance agreements that say something to the effect of um, the, uh, the provisions of the original instrument or contract uh, are still in force except as modified by this agreement. And so if there's no specific a provision in the forbearance agreement saying we are extending the statute of limitations or this defense is waived. A borrower could point to that and say, well, you said everything else was in effect and we were in default and here we stated it right here in your agreement. So so uh, it's a good way to, to prevent some, some risk there. And, and just one last point outside the forbearance agreement context, most states, including Kansas, uh, have cases on the books that suggest that you can take an affirmative act to de-accelerate once you've accelerated, uh, be that a one-page letter, um, uh, and, and actually that's, uh, or some kind of uh, form, depending on the jurisdiction, that's a useful tool as well if you're worried about uh, long-term enforcement and statutes of limitations. So with that, I will hand it off to whoever's next, <laughs> number four. Yeah, that's me. So, and, and one last comment on that. I, I, I get it. We've got a lot of lenders in the audience and they're like, yeah, right. Deaccelerate after the loan's been placed on non-accrual. I get it that that's not going to go anywhere with uh, with management where you're just trying to move this loan off your books, but it's a remedy to be aware of. It's an option in your toolbox. And you, know, you want to know how to use all the tools in your toolbox, even though there's some of those tools you may not use very often, okay? This next case number or yeah case quiz comes out of uh, out of Arizona, and uh, it's really odd fact pattern, but it it's going to get into I think a really important legal principle that really applies beyond this. So in this very odd situation, you have this parcel of real property jointly owned by the debtor and this other person. Uh, the bank has a lien on the other borrower's interest in the property, but not an actual deed of trust in the property. Right, so it's a little bit odd, but that's that's the scenario. So the bankruptcy trustee, hey, he says, hey, I've got this property, I'm going to sell it. The trustee wants to get a windfall, so the trustee tries to sell it and says, hey, I'm, I'm selling free and clear, and I should get all of the cash, 100% of the cash proceeds should go to the bankruptcy estate. So the, uh, the lender objects saying, no, we have a lien in the other borrower's interest in the property. Question is, who wins in this scenario? Well, the answer is the lender, 
And uh, what we have here is, you know, the, the code cites the, the free and clear provisions of Section 363 of the Bankruptcy Code, but the court makes it clear that you're not, that that does not permit the sale free and clear of the lender's interest in the non-debtor's ownership interest of the real property, okay? So the, the cash has to go to the lender, right? Hooray, lender wins, all right? Now, what's the important takeaway here? Now, if you recall, we did a case, I think it was in Q1, we was talking about a case out of uh, Houston, a bankruptcy case down there, and there was some, and the uh, lender, had a lien in the debtor's accounts receivable. And then post-petition, the debtor sold land, and uh, which was unencumbered, and the lender came in and said, hey, I've got a, a lien in AR. I, I should get the cash proceeds. And the bankruptcy court there ruled against the lender, but the reason the lender lost is because the bankruptcy filing had occurred. And there's that, that demarcation between you know pre-petition pre assets and post-petition assets, okay? But my point here is that this is the same concept and a lot of lenders are going to have blanket liens and accounts receivable general intangibles and payment uh, payments and or payment intangibles under the ucc and a lot of times when you're looking at your lien you may say oh i'm i'm just a you know i'm a glorified unsecured creditor i have a lien in accounts receivable right um and what we fail to realize is that if there is a sale of real estate you have a contract, right? Or you have land, it's then turned into a contract for the sale of land, right? So there's this contractual right, this, this asset that's now come into an existence and then there's a sale and there's going to be an account receivable generated as a result of that sale. And now suddenly what's happened is we've taken the land and we're making the assumption here that it's unencumbered land. You've taken real estate and now you've transferred that real estate into a different asset class, which is, you know, becomes a, a contract for sale. Now it's going to be turned into cash and account receivable. And suddenly there's an argument that the lender's lien can now apply to these additional proceeds. All right. And so the point here is know your borrower and, you know, be prepared to jump on these provisions in your security agreements that say, hey, payment intangibles, general intangibles, accounts receivable. I'm entitled to get them, okay? All right, next quiz, number five. Chris, moving into the world of HELOCs. All right, and for those taking notes at home, a HELOC is a home equity line of credit. Um, and it, so in this particular case, you had a, um, a, a HELOC. Uh, they called it something different. They called it a maximizer agreement. Uh, Essentially, you have, the borrower could draw on this line of credit and the lender took an interest, uh, probably a second position uh, in the borrower's home. And it had a, a closed draw period and a maturity date, but no specific sum uh, of money that was mentioned. And this agreement was endorsed in blank. Uh, and so we'll pause here. Um, so any lawyers uh, on uh, that, are, that are watching, uh, we don't mean to give you PTSD by going back to Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code, but this, uh, this HELOC was uh, supposed to be a negotiable instrument. And so a negotiable instrument, uh, just as a quick refresher, is uh, governed by the UCC Article 3 and uh, can be transferred by negotiation, which is basically handing the original uh, over to, um, to a transferee. And you can do that by either endorsing uh, it to order or to a specific person, or you can endorse it blank. And so we all remember when we got the check from our grandmother, checks are a type of, uh, of instrument, and your grandmother would say, now don't endorse the check until you get to the bank window and hand it to the teller. And the reason is, if you simply endorse the back of a check, you have endorsed it in blank. You have not endorsed it to anybody. And therefore, it becomes bearer paper or payable to bearer, which means that anyone with physical possession of the original now has the right to, uh, to enforce it. And uh, under Article 3, there is... Uh, there's a definition of negotiable instrument which says that it is uh, payable, uh, you know, a, a fixed amount of money has to be uh, payable. Um, sorry, an unconditional promise, to, I'll do the exact definition, unconditional promise to pay a fixed amount of money. And so what do you do when you have a HELOC? 
where there's no fixed amount of money mentioned. There's simply uh, a withdrawal period and then there uh, is a maturity date. Does it qualify as a negotiable instrument? Yes, it does. Uh, this is a Nevada case, uh, the Wishing, Wishingrad case. The court held that because there was a closed draw period and a specified maturity date, that met the requirement of, uh, of a fixed amount of money, even though it wasn't uh, actually put on the particular document, the, the amount of money that would end up being owed. And the reason that this is an issue uh, is because negotiable instruments can be transferred much more easily than other types of contracts. Uh, if you're selling a contract to somebody that is not a negotiable instrument, you actually have to have some kind of assignment document. And moreover, if it's been assigned and sold several times, you have to be able to present a chain of assignment. That is not the case with a negotiable instrument under the UCC. If you are the holder, i.e. you are either the bearer of a note endorsed in blank or uh, a note that's been uh, endorsed to you, uh, you are pre your uh, your right to enforce that is presumptively valid. The signatures are presumptively valid, and you don't have to show a chain of assignment. And the borrower is then uh, forced to come up with some kind of evidence that either by fraud or you're you're in fact not the the rightful party, uh, and then it places the the burden back on the borrower that way. Um, I should mention that this is not a uniform position. Florida courts, uh, at least two that I can think of, have gone the way, uh, gone the other way, and said, "Look, a uh, fixed amount of money means fixed amount of money, and it's not on your HELOC, and therefore it is not a negotiable instrument." So uh, I, I meant to put a site in our materials, didn't get to it before we submitted them. My apologies. I'll, I'll give it to you now. Um, this is a Florida case. Pardon? This is a Florida case site um, 312 Southern Reporter 3rd 1015, um, and it's called Demacus v. SunTrust Bank. And so that's one of the leading cases on this HELOC issue. And with that, I will hand it off to, uh, to Tom. Great. Thanks, Chris. So uh, we move on to a case where a uh, father and a son and uh, the father is trying to uh, prove up his uh, claim against the, the son's estate bankruptcy. So here's the question. The debtor, who's the son, gives dad a personal property lien, which dad perfects with a UCC filing. Son files for bankruptcy. Post-petition, the dad's UCC financing statement lapses. In other words, the dad did not file a continuation statement. Does the post-petition lapse of the financing statement extinguish the lien? Answer is no, but it might impact the priority of the lien. Um, this, uh, well, just a couple of the quick takeaways here. The valid lien status is determined as of the bankruptcy petition date, uh, you know, but an unperfected security agreement will be deemed unsecured uh, by virtue of the trustee's strong arm powers. Here, uh, yeah, I thought this was an interesting case. There are actually some complicated facts, and this was more of a, of a case where the proof of claim uh, was actually reduced. The, the dad had uh, listed several items on the proof of claim and didn't have uh, great documentation uh, really for most of it. Um, the, uh, and, there, and complicating things, and I'll just read from the case. By the way, thank you, Mike and Chris, for allowing me to crash the party. I think I've read more cases in one sitting than I have in, in quite a while. But here the court said that the debtor is also acting as his father's attorney in advocating for the allowance of his father's claim against his own bankruptcy estate. So the two men are in three discrete relationships that are relevant, father, son, debtor, creditor, and attorney, client. What a mess. Well, as, as a result of these relationships, the court uh, applied a heightened scrutiny standard basically treated the father like an insider and uh, and applying that standard uh, quite a quite a few of the components of the father's claim were uh, were just simply simply not proven not not enough documentation 
So in the end, what started out as about a hundred and eighty thousand dollar claim was reduced to about thirty thousand. I'll turn it over. So file your financing statements, right? Don't let them lapse. That's the moral of that story. I actually know that attorney. Uh, I had a case several years ago where he was uh, kind of representing some debtors and had to deal with him on, when I was representing a creditor. Uh, and sad to see he filed bankruptcy. Anyway, let's move on. So question, this will be a quick one. Who has the burden of proof when you are enforcing an agricultural lien and what is the level of burden of proof, all right? Well, the answer is it's the person who seeks to enforce the agricultural lien has the burden of proof and it has to be done by a preponderance of the evidence. So <clears throat> I know people are saying, well, why is that such a big deal? And here's the reason. Um, <clears throat> in the ag lending world, that's kind of the, the big whammy out there for lenders. Is there some sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, agricultural lien that's going to, that somebody's going to try to use to prime you. Now, this particular case comes out of Kansas. It involved a veterinarian's lien. And I remember reading the case. I was I was reading it and I was like, yeah, this this veterinarian really did provide the <clears throat> excuse me, provide the uh, uh, services. But where he got tripped up was he didn't meet his burden of proof, which is preponderance of the evidence, which is 50 50 and the court dinged him. Now, the moral of the story here is if you are a lender and somebody is asserting an agricultural lien, one of the questions you need to ask, because there's always negotiation, do we agree to it, do we don't, do we challenge it? One of the practical questions that you need to ask is, can the other party prove up their lien? If you'll recall, we had a, another case earlier this year, it came out of Iowa involving, I think it was Compere Financial, there was an ag lien up there, a supplier's lien on cattle. It dealt with a million dollar loan and the court ruled 100,000 went to the supplier, but the court remanded on the other 900,000 because it wasn't clear from the record whether the supplier could prove up their case about supply and feed and whatnot and benefiting specific cattle, okay? And so my, my point here is that when you're dealing with the ag liens, uh, that is, the, the burden of proof is a, it, it's kind of a defensive position that you can raise, really hold their feet to it. And if the records aren't that good, which is frequently the case in agricultural settings, then you may get a little bit lucky and be able to defeat a supposed uh, agricultural lien. All right, number eight, Chris. That's me, okay. We have an odd case that seems very Wisconsin specific, but it does have uh, have some good points uh, in general for, for lenders seeking to enforce consumer loans. So lender files a small claim lawsuit against a borrower seeking to collect funds it is owed. Uh, borrower files a counterclaim uh, and, among other things, uh, see, sought to uh, basically get out of the debt by claiming a violation of the Wisconsin Consumer Act. Now, this Consumer Act has a provision in it that says that a lender can trigger liability by doing, quote, any action in, to enforce its rights arising from a consumer credit transaction. So the lender uh, seeks to defeat the counterclaim it, by dismissing its affirmative claim and arguing, well, gosh, there's no more action. Uh, and so you can't maintain uh, you can't maintain your own cause of action under the Consumer uh, Act in Wisconsin. Does it work? No, it does not. Uh, Wisconsin Court of Appeals said that merely by filing, you've already triggered potential liability. Uh, and, and no lender, you cannot simply get rid of the action uh, and, and relieve yourself uh, of potential liability. And so again, this is somewhat Wisconsin specific, but it is a good reminder to, if you are a, a lender, especially in the consumer context, uh, make sure you have all your ducks in the row before uh, going that final step to litigation, because it does have the potential, if you've made any missteps, to blow up in your face. And we'll hand it off to yeah, it's me. Who's got nine? Yeah, it's Next me. One. But we've had a couple of questions come through, and I need to respond to the questions really quick. So a couple of the questions they dealt with 
Tom's case earlier about the filing of the continuation statement post petition. And the gist of the question was, or questions is, you know, do you need relief from the automatic stay uh, to file the continuation statement? The short answer is no, there's an exception under the bankruptcy code where you can do that. It's under, uh, I believe, section 546. Um, and as a practical matter, what very frequently happens, especially if you are, if you get into a uh, um, adequate protection scenario, uh, if you're the main lender or if you've done a debtor in possession loan. So either one of those scenarios, uh, I think every adequate protection cash collateral order I, I think I've ever seen allows for automatic perfection. And so there's language built in there. Uh, but in case it's not, you've got the exception under the bankruptcy code. The next question uh, came with the Agline one. And the question was, do Kansas courts require strict compliance with Agline statutes, i.e. input suppliers, liens, or is substantial compliance sufficient? It's a great question. There's not, not a whole lot of uh, case law out there. My understanding is that uh, courts are going to generally require substantial compliance, but pretty substantial compliance. I'm not aware of courts in Kansas where they say, oh, you didn't dot this particular I or cross this particular T and they, they ding people. So I think if you're a lender, um, you need to be looking more at the, um, the gist of it, have they substantially complied? And if they are, I think you have to make the assumption that a court probably is going to go against you. And the reason I say that is we, we did talk earlier about that case out of Kansas that required strict compliance with the um, the vehicle filing, okay? But that case arises in the context of a federal bankruptcy, and it seems that bankruptcy judges, at least some, and, and this particular judge who issued the opinion, they seem to be more strict constructionists. And the challenge when you get into state court is, you know, are you going to get somebody who's more a strict constructionist or somebody who is more loosey-goosey and, eh, close enough, right? Uh, and I think to be safe, you probably need to assume that your judge is probably going to be kind of the, the loosey-goosey, yeah, close enough um, statute, right? Because uh, courts don't like to see kind of injustices and equities done unless, of course, it's an insurer or a lender, right? It seems courts always want to do strict compliance against the lender. So that's just my two cents on that. All right. So uh, this next one we'll do really quick. Uh, number nine. This case comes out of New York. Uh, you had a, a loan. It's in bankruptcy. It's a below market loan, meaning or uh, the below market interest rate loan. So the borrower is like, hey, this is a great deal. I'm going to assume the loan and just get it reinstated so I can keep having this below interest market rate. Lender comes in and says, uh, 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 you, you defaulted. And if you want to assume a contract, you're going to have to cure, which means there's all this default interest, attorney's fees that the loan requires. So there's a fight. Question is, who wins? And the court correctly in this situation says the lender wins. And the reason for that is because we're dealing with the assumption of an executory contract. And it's really clear that if you have an executory contract, you have to cure the defaults if you're going to assume it. And that's what the court required here. So uh, we're in this world of high rising interest rates, and you may have a borrower who is current on your loan, but who may have other financial troubles. And if they file and want to reinstate your loan when you're in that negotiation and plan confirmation, uh, the lender really needs to be kind of pounding the table to get the um, uh, you know, get everything paid, the, all the default interest, all the attorney's fees, et cetera, et cetera. All right, number 10, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So here's the question number 10. Borrower enters into a loan agreement with the lender. At the time the loan was entered into, the borrower made some materially false statements. In this case, I think it was uh, uh, false financial statements or false financial records. They made material false statements at the time the loan was entered into. Lender makes the loan. Uh, sometime later, the borrower defaulted and uh, lender accelerated the loan. This is a statute of limitations question here. So the borrower argues that the statute of limitations begins to run uh, at the time the loan was entered into, because that, in fact, was when the uh, false statements were made. And the lender, of course, wants the um, 
what's the statute of limitations to run at the occurrence of default and acceleration? Who wins? In this case, the lender. So uh, if, if you uh, remember way back to quiz number three, I think the outcome of this case was uh, similar to the one that Chris discussed in quiz number three. The key obligation here was the repayment of the note. And so, um, and, the, and the court really relied on language in the, uh, in the note or the loan agreement that said that if there is a default, the lender may accelerate the debt and pursue various rights and remedies. So it was permissive, but not mandatory. So, uh, you know, the key, key takeaway here is, well, the borrower did make a creative argument here. <laughs> Most of us, when we when we do uh, borrower side work, we we try to avoid uh, defaults that uh, you know right out of the gate by carefully reviewing representations and warranties and qualifying them. In this case, uh, the borrower uh, was hopeful to use that uh, to to their advantage. Uh, said, "Look, I I lied to you from the start, uh, and and uh, unfortunately, you didn't accelerate the loan back then, and and therefore." You know, lender, the, the statute is run, and 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 you lose. But you know, in this case, it was really a question of the material, you know, significant obligations being repayment, and the fact that uh, the lender uh, uh, didn't pursue its remedies until later on. With that I'll pass it over. <clears throat> All right. So, if you've dozed to sleep, if you're just kind of nodding off, if you're looking at your emails. Stop. All right. This one, this case right here that I'm going to talk about, this is actually a really important one. And I'm, I'm, I, it, it genuinely is. This is a really big deal right here. This case we're going to talk about. It's in the, it comes out of chapter 12. It's absolutely going to apply in chapter 11. And it's a really bad decision for lenders. It's really bad because we are headed into a high interest rate environment. And uh, we are going to feel ramifications of this opinion if you're representing a lender. All right. So this case comes out of Iowa. It goes ultimately up to the Eighth Circuit. The lender is fully secured. It's a Chapter 12 plan. It's farmland up there in Iowa. You know, land's fertile, very productive. And they agreed on a 20-year repayment plan. Um, but there's a fight about what's the applicable interest rate. The debtor wants the treasury rate, uh, the, the, the treasury bond rate, and the lender wants the prime rate, okay? And they both recognize in light of the Supreme Court's till decision from the, the 2000s that there's a, a slight adjustment, so a 2% adjustment. So the question is, which rate does the bankruptcy court pick, which is ultimately affirmed by the Eighth Circuit? Well, obviously, with the lead-in language that I just gave you, 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 you already know what the answer is, and the uh, answer is the treasury bond rate, all right? So think about that. You have a debtor, they can't cut it, they go into chapter 12, or, or you could say chapter 11, and the court's saying, you know, there's really not that much risk, we're gonna just give you the treasury bond rate plus about 2% interest, right? And, and any lender with any common sense would say that is insane, that is crazy, that is just so divorced of reality because this person would not be able to go out into the market with their very poor financial condition and get a loan for that amount. And yet we have the court here reaching that result. Now, let's talk about why the court gets there and, and what you can do to hopefully try to avoid that uh, when your borrower files, because probably all of you lenders out there have some commercial real estate on your books, which is not looking the best from a portfolio perspective. And we're likely going to be dealing with these issues in the next couple of years. All right. So the, the, the one thing about this decision, first off, the Supreme Court said, yes, the, the Supreme, excuse me, the Eighth Circuit here says the Supreme Court's Till decision, which came out of Chapter 13, the till decision just focused on the the prime rate, uh, the prime rate of mar the market prime rate, and said that's the starting point. And then we're going to add one to two percent as a as a risk adjustment because this is somebody in bankruptcy. And so that's been the prevailing standard in Chapter 13s across the country ever since then. What the Eighth Circuit said is that they said, hey, everybody until just assumed that prime was the applicable rate, but the Eighth Circuit said, guess what? The Till decision did not say 
that uh, prime is the applicable rate. And so then the court pokes around, looks at the different arguments, and in this case, it, it noted that there was actually some similarities in the interest rate amount, and the court ultimately decides that the treasury bond rate is the, really, is the applicable rate to be using, okay? Now, hindsight's 2020, and you can see here on my second bullet point under the key takeaways, the lender, this is a farm, uh, farm, uh, farm credit lender up there in Iowa, they had agreed with the debtor ahead of time on the 20 year payment term, but that the dispute was the rate and that's what they left to the court. And in hindsight, you know, that was a mistake. They obviously didn't know that at the time. Um, but when you are the lender and when you are negotiating these terms, you absolutely don't want to be put in that situation where you get this partial agreement and then you're going to throw it up there to the judge to decide maybe the last little bit. And I think if you as a lender are up there and you're like, you can't reach an agreement, we'll just let the court decide, you need to internally be prepared to have that kind of ram down your throat, all right? And I don't like that. Nobody likes that. But that just seems to be one of the injustices in the world is it tends to be if you're an insurance company or a bank, courts tend to look negatively on you. I mean, and that's that's just the reality of the matter. Not always. There's definitely times when the lender wins, but you have to have that 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 risk in mind if you're going to throw it up there to the judge. A better result, obviously, is you try to negotiate everything ahead of time, recognizing these risks. Now, this Eighth Circuit opinion, it's binding. So if you're in the Eighth Circuit, Missouri, Minnesota, Iowa, um, Arkansas, you know, those state, the Dakotas, this is going to be binding on you. If you're outside of that sphere, you're, if your debtor files bankruptcy, say in Texas or, you know, Kansas or Wisconsin, those are not Eighth Circuit cases, but you can bet that courts are going to be really looking at this decision and debtors are going to be saying, hey, the treasury bond rate is the applicable rate. Let's run with it. All right. So, it's bad news for us, It's but we have to live with it. All right, enough of the bad news. Let's move on to some good news, right? Number 12, I think Chris, I think this one's yours. Yes, uh, we, have, we have another statute of limitations uh, uh, case. We have a case in which both sides, borrower and lender, agree that the statute of limitations is six years. So what's all the fuss about? Uh, little background facts, borrower obtains loan uh, and a deed of trust. Uh, the deed of trust is uh, supported uh, or, or basically secures a promissory note, another negotiable instrument. 2006, they, uh, they default and stop making payments two years later. Uh, the maturity date is 2021. So we're looking at a, some kind of 15 year mortgage. 2022, the lender sends a notice of default and the borrower files suit seeking to quiet title to the property, uh, arguing that the deed of trust is unenforceable because the underlying instrument is unenforceable. Uh, the borrower says, yes, it's a six year uh, statute of limitations. Uh, and it's the six, it's Utah's uh, statute of limitations for general uh, written contracts. And that began to run when we defaulted way back in 2008. Uh, the lender says, no, this is a negotiable instrument. It is governed by UCC Article 3, and therefore it begins to run in uh, at the maturity date. Uh, and of course, the subtext here relating back to our quiz number three is that there has been no uh, act of acceleration, at least not one that's discussed in this case. So who wins? The lender wins. I should note that this is currently on appeal to the Tenth Circuit, so the lender wins for now, uh, but but it will likely be affirmed. Um, under Utah law, uh, the court reasoned that that the negotiable instrument, it, yes, is a written contract, but it is narrower and it is governed by a very specific statute, which is Article Three uh, of the UCC. Therefore, the uh, obligation. Uh, did not come finally due until the maturity date, and that is when the the, uh, the statute of limitations began to run. Um, so, some key takeaways here: uh, don't uh, I, these are not cases in which you would generally want to risk this. Uh, there is a much older than the UCC notion in the common law that uh, lenders should not sit on their rights, uh, and this is a good result for the lender. But again. Uh, 
generally would advise against waiting over a decade uh, to bring any kind of an enforcement action against a borrower. Um, and this isn't discussed in this case, but this is the sort of thing where uh, a defense that you don't see uh, successful uh, be successful very often, which is that of latches, which is uh, uh, basically saying, yes, they're within te technically within the statute of limitations, but they waited too long to enforce their rights. I could see certain courts looking very favorably uh, on borrowers in this particular case uh, under a sort of latches uh, theory. And so uh, with that, I will hand it off to, is it Tom again? Yeah, yep. back to Tom. Okay. Back to me for bad news after uh, after some positive. So we're just doing um, a roller coaster of ups and downs here today. That's all right. it is. For sure, for sure. So here's the question. Uh, lender has a blanket lien on the borrower's accounts. The borrower, without the lender's approval, uh, enters into a factoring arrangement, and then they sell their receivables to a factoring company. Uh, the borrower defaults. The lender sued the factoring company for conversion. And in this particular case, there were, there were not any allegations of collusion between the borrower and the factoring company. Who wins? Well, in this case, uh, the, the factoring company did. Uh, there was, as I said, there was no proof of collusion here. And in, in this particular case, the court applied uh, UCC, I think it was 9, yeah, 9332, uh, which uh, provides in part that if, if uh, a transferee of money takes the money uh, free of the security interest, unless the transferee was acting in collusion with the debtor. Uh, there was no proof of collusion in this case. Uh, and so uh, unfortunately for the lender that had the, uh, the, the initial lien on the receivables, um, they were, were not able to prove collusion and, um, and could, could not get those back. So the key takeaway here really is uh, to closely monitor borrower's activity. Um, you know, the, I, know, I know there's a lot of arrangements that are, that are set up with, with that sort of feature already, uh, you know, with uh, daily account sweeps or weekly account sweeps and that sort of thing. Um, you know, certainly in this case, I have to assume there was a covenant that was breached where the, 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 uh, the borrower was not allowed to enter into this factoring arrangement. Uh, but, uh, you know, in this situation, I think the receivables that were collected went up over half a million dollars before, uh, before the lender started pursuing the remedies. Uh, and so key takeaway here is really monitoring. That's an off to question 14. All right. Uh, this is a Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act case uh, out of uh, out of Missouri. And uh, creditor obtains judgment against a debtor. Uh, a, a debtor in an unrelated matter receives an award of funds and in, uh, in an effort to keep it away from the judgment creditor deposits the funds in his joint bank account with his wife. Debtor is in Missouri, which has tenants by the entirety. And so tenants by the entirety for those taking notes at home is uh, a, a special feature of the really came up through the common law, which says that assets that you hold with your spouse are held in tenancy by the entireties and are not touchable by judgment creditors unless the judgment creditor has a judgment against both you and your spouse. Right. So anyone who's done a loan in a uh, tenancy by the entirety states has probably looked at a deed of trust and said, you know, John and Jane Smith holding title as husband and wife. Now, you, you know, in odd situations, they can hold it as tenants in common, but most often uh, you will see that in an entirety state. And that makes that particular piece of real property uh somewhat immune uh, to, to judgment creditors, at least with respect to the individuals. So the debtor says, well, uh, yes, this, is a, this account is tenancy by the, uh, the entireties, um, so you can't touch it. And yet it's not a transfer under the, U, uh, the UFTA because I can uh, retain control of the funds. So who wins? Does the court go for this? 
No, they do not. The judgment creditor is successful here in getting the court to recognize that a transfer of funds from separate to tenants by the entirety is a transfer for purposes of, of the, U, uh, the UFTA. And th this would be very similar to uh, if, a, if a debtor had a trust uh, in which they were either the set settler of the trust or the beneficiary of the trust or obtained control over trust funds. Uh, the the uh, most courts would would look at this and say, yeah, I know you, you're this particular account is in the trust name, but you have complete control of it, so we're going to allow a uh, uh, a fraudulent transfer action against that. And so, um, another uh, tip on this is that UFTA claims uh, often can be forgotten forgotten by creditors. Um, and I can see why uh, they they can be very messy. Uh, it's awfully rare to uh, get someone up on the stand under the UFTA, which which recognizes, by the way, two types of fraud: um, actual fraud and constructive fraud. And constructive fraud is what you usually are left with, which is the court has to amass a number of facts and then make a determination as to whether the uh, transfer was. Uh, Fraudulent, uh, fraudulent. It's very hard to get an, uh, a ruling of actual fraud because most people that are hiding assets from their creditors, they will not get up on the stand and say, yes, I intended to defraud my creditors. Uh, I, I, I wish that was the case, but you're, you're, you, uh, you're lucky if you get that, uh, that kind of uh, debtor who suddenly has, a, has an attack of honesty. Uh, so I will hand it off. And I'm going to do this one super, super quick because I know we're at 50 minutes and the next one from Tom is important that we cover. So the short answer here, this is actually a Supreme Court case. There was an arbitration clause. Uh, it's a class action. Court rules. No, it has to stay in court. The creditor appeals. Um, and the question is, does the lower court have to stay the proceeding pending the appeal? Short answer, again, from the Supreme Court is yes, it does. Now, why is this significant? The answer is because a lot of lenders, increasingly there's lenders that are putting arbitration clauses in their agreements. And if a court rules against you, uh, the Supreme Court is like, and not just the Supreme Court, all the courts, there's a strong, strong bias or tendency or leaning towards arbitration. And this is just one more further weight on that scale in favor of arbitration so um it's it's good for lenders if that's if that's where you want to be tom let's talk about social media accounts yeah yeah not not just for funny cat videos as it turns out we've got we've got one uh, where it was uh disputed in a, in a bankruptcy uh, case so i thought this one was pretty interesting so you've got a company ceo who uses his own uh social media accounts arguably his personal social media accounts to promote the company's products and occasionally in the court in this case figured about 10 percent of the time for personal content only the ceo is fired uh, the company files for bankruptcy uh, the company wants the rights to these ceo social media accounts to be declared uh, part of the property of the bankruptcy estate who wins the company in this case. Uh, and so uh, because the company regularly uses these accounts and they were really important for the marketing of these products, by the way, I understand they were energy drinks, uh, bang energy drinks, if that means anything to anyone in the audience. I'm not sure if those are still around, but those were the products that were being promoted here. Uh, the court really, <laughs> they actually are looking for a better standard to apply in this case. Um, they looked at a few different factors uh, you know, and couldn't prove the first two of those factors, so ended up going to a third. So uh, you know, the first one was uh, documentary interest. Uh, is, is there any documentation, i.e. an employment agreement, uh, between the CEO and the company that, that gives any indication about whether these accounts are the CEO's property or the company's property? They couldn't find anything. Uh, definitive on that case. Uh, number two was um, had to do with control of the accounts, and uh, you know, of course, social media accounts. You've got a login and a password. Well, the CEO would certainly had his own login and password, 
but would occasionally turn that login and password information over to uh, other people in the company so that they could post on his behalf. Again, not really clear uh, on the control question. So in the end, the court really relied on use and they did a, they actually did a bit of a, a mathematical uh, equation here where they looked at, I'm gonna call it 300 social media posts and made a determination whether, oh, this one's personal or this one is marketing the product or this one's kind of in between, but kind of leans toward marketing the product. I think they actually read all of these posts and they concluded that about 90% of them were, uh, you know, had some, in some way, shape or form were intended to promote this, uh, this energy drink. And so uh, the, you know, based on that, the, the company gets, gets these accounts. If that was 50%, who knows? Uh, but the court was really looking for uh, the first two parts of this standard and couldn't find anything and kind of used uh, this use question and this math as, as a fallback. So I think there's gonna be more to follow on this. This is uh, definitely an area that's developing. Yeah, it raises questions about how do you take it, security interest in it, can you even foreclose, et cetera, et cetera. All right, we're actually basically at the end of our hour. I'll just, question here is you have HELOCs, borrower files bankruptcy, they wanna say the bankruptcy discharge triggers running of the statute of limitations. Question is who wins? And the short answer is, the lender here because a bankruptcy discharge is just in personam, meaning it relates to the person, but not in rem, which means the property. And the court here says, nope, sorry, bankruptcy just discharge is just to the person individually, but the property still remain liable. So the limitations period is not deemed to expire there. Um, we threw here at the end some cases of no, you can, they're in your materials, you can read through them. They are Kind of interesting and important case of the Missouri Supreme Court for those that are there that deals with the Missouri Commercial Receivership Act. Uh, and anyway, you can see the cases there. Uh, we really truly are at the very end of our materials here today. The um, uh, Just as a reminder, it's gonna be on December 6th um, at noon. That's I believe that's a Wednesday. That's when we're going to do the fourth quarter review for 2023. Uh, so you can put that on your calendars and be looking forward to it. Uh, just as a quick reminder, the program has been approved for legal education hours. You report your hours at the CE, CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. You will receive a certificate of attendance for this, including course numbers. It will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast. Uh, and then there's a survey that comes out at the very end. We'd ask you to complete it because we definitely want to hear from you. One of the questions I have is would a presentation on kind of a, a primer on a, a uh, commercial real estate workout, would that be helpful for you? That's one question I've had on my mind today. So uh, if there's other aspects, issues, items you'd like to see, please complete the survey. Just let us know your thoughts. We, we definitely look at those surveys. So with that, that concludes our uh, webinar for today. Thank you for attending.